When people ask me where I grew up, I tell them all over the United States. My dad was in the Air Force, which meant that about once a year, we would pack up all of our things, say goodbye to all of our friends, and move across the country to a new military base in a new state. Doing this time and time again forged an early appreciation for new cultures and new friends, which now presents as a desire for interdisciplinary and collaborative research. Moving so often also meant that my best friends were really my dad on the right and my brother on the left, which is why I was so devastated as an eight-year-old when my father was killed on active duty. My brother and I were torn apart. We had just lost our father, but we had also just lost our best friend. But just as we had done before, we packed up all of our things, said goodbye to all of our friends, and moved across the country to, this time, off the military base for good. Years later, when I was 14, my brother was hit by a drunk driver and killed. For the second time in my life, I lost my best friend and my father figure. Losing my brother and my father at such a young age forced me to be resilient, and it also inspired me to pursue a career in healthcare where I could directly extend the lives of others. Having always been an engineer at heart, I decided to pursue biomedical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And it was there where I got involved in research, undergraduate research, uh, working on brain imaging and machine learning. In the summer of 2015, I had the opportunity to do a summer internship at the University of Utah. And I honestly knew very little about Utah. I probably couldn't have pointed it out to you on a map, but I did know about this device. And this is the Utah Electrode Array, which is the most commonly used brain-computer interface in the world. And this tiny little device, pictured here on top of a penny, can be implanted into the nervous system to provide a bi-directional link to external devices. And it was during that summer where I had the opportunity to work on a brain-computer interface solution for individuals suffering from limb loss. But before I dive into that research, I'd like to just take a minute to think about how limb loss would impact our lives. So imagine you've just woken up in the hospital to find out that both of your hands have been amputated. How would you go about your daily life? How would you hold a fork to feed yourself? How would you tie your shoes or play catch with your kid? But more importantly, how would you feel, physically the world that's around you, but also emotionally as a whole individual? As put by one of the amputee participants we worked with, losing a limb is like losing a family member, except you are reminded of it every day. Having lost two family members myself, this quote really stuck with me and inspired me to dedicate my research career towards helping individuals suffering from life-altering neuromuscular impairments. So I returned to the University of Utah to work on my PhD in biomedical engineering, where our goal was to restore dexterous motor control to individuals um, suffering from limb loss. So to do this, we implant the Utah Array into the residual arm nerves of an individual. We also implant an EMG Array into the residual arm muscles of that same individual. From there, when a person thinks about an action, such as moving their hand, information starts in their brain, travels down through their nerves to their muscles, where we can record those signals and then translate those into intuitive and dexterous control of a bionic arm. And what's better than a bionic arm that's controlled by thought? Well, it's a bionic arm that can also restore a sense of touch to the user. So this same system, when the prosthetic hand makes contact with an object, we can record the mechanical forces that are exerted on the hand and translate those into electrical stimulation of the arm nerve. That then sends information back up to the brain through the endogenous biological pathway. That information is interpreted by the user as a sensation coming from their missing hand. We can then tie the motor control and sensory feedback together to create a closed-loop control system where your motor actions influence your sensory perception and your sensory feedback guides your motor control. And ultimately, using this closed-loop control system, we can replace a bionic arm with something that the user believes is more like their biological hand. So far, we've been able to demonstrate that this system can restore an individual's fine sensory motor dexterity, such that they can manipulate fragile objects without breaking them, and they can also identify objects simply by touch. 
What's better is that the system can also reduce chronic pain associated with limb loss, and the implanted devices are viable long-term. But best of all is the emotional impact that comes with restoring a person's sense of touch. Pictured here is our participant's first opportunity to hold hands with his wife and feel her touch again for the first time in 14 years. Our key publication on this research had an alt metric of 958. It was featured on dozens of media outlets all over the world, um, and it was highlighted as one of the most um, well-publicized projects at the U. It, it raised over um, $4.5 million in advertising for the University of Utah alone. At the end of my uh, PhD, I knew two things. I wanted to be a professor, and I loved the Utah lifestyle. I mean, graduate school was amazing. I loved the research. I loved the skiing. I loved all the people I worked with. I loved the skiing. <laughs> I loved the environment. And did I mention that I loved the skiing? So much so that I actually got married up at Alta Ski Resort this past year. So I knew I wanted to be a, a faculty member at the University of Utah, but I also knew that that was going to be a difficult transition to make happen. So that's when I started looking into the NIH Director's Early Independence Award. My goal was to try to carve out a scientific niche for myself, um, as well as secure some early stage research funding. And so um, here I am, a third year PhD student, trying to convince uh, the NIH to give me $2 million to uh, work on a project that is entirely new to me um, and also never been done before at the University of Utah. Um, and I'm incredibly thankful for the University of Utah Health um, and all of my mentors, particularly the Clinical and Translational Science Institute for supporting me in this uh, ambitious grant writing mission. Um, I'm excited to say that in, in October of 2020, I was awarded the NIH Director's Early Independence Award. I was one of 13 individuals that year. Um, and this was also the first and only uh, Early Independence Award at the University of Utah, and also the first and only um, in the Intermountain West. Around that same time, I was also recognized as one of Forbes 30 Under 30. So at 27 years old, I started my own lab, the Utah Neurorobotics Lab, here at the University of Utah. Flash forward to today, two years later, I'm excited to say that our lab has grown a ton. We now have over 30 people, featuring two research associates, seven PhD students, several masters and undergraduate students as well. My lab is now working on commercializing our neural prosthetic system. So we recently received FDA approval to do an at-home study with this system. And we also recently licensed some of our technology behind this to a startup company to help bring this device to market. And so I'll show a quick video of how this system works. And I'd like to point out this individual's continual surprise and enjoyment as he goes about his daily routine with newfound dexterity. Mr. Piggy. Thank you, Piggy. Thank you. Ah! <laughs> it didn't hit the floor. Thank you. Good girl. I could do this, it'd be a miracle. Hmm. As put by one of the participants we worked with, soon it will be just like Luke Skywalker, and then everyone will want one. And that's exactly what my lab is working on next. We're developing a wristband that you can wear that can detect electrical activity and translate that into intuitive control of smart home devices. So yes, each and every one of you here will soon be Jedi masters capable of controlling your smart home devices telepathically. <laughs> but who will this technology really benefit the most? It's probably not you or me. It's the millions of individuals out there who are suffering from life-altering neuromuscular disabilities, not just amputation, but also stroke and spinal cord injury. We are now fortunate to live in a world where we have smart home devices filled in our homes as well as in our hospitals. And we envision a world, an inclusive world, in which individuals um, can control these devices intuitively and seamlessly regardless of their physical capabilities. We recently had the opportunity to test this technology with an individual with a high-level spinal cord injury. And this is what they had to say. Well, I'm more excited about this than, honestly, anything that's happened since uh, I broke my neck. I mean, 10 degrees of freedom, I could, I could just imagine anything. So the possibilities truly are endless. 
If you can imagine it, then we'll be working on it at the Utah Neurorobotics Lab to turn it from science fiction into reality. With that, I'd like to thank the many individuals who've contributed to this research, as well as the many government agencies um, who've helped support our research and our industry partners. And thank you all so much for listening. <laughs>